Good evening, everyone. I hope you're well and welcome to our webinar on orthopedic surgery. My name's Louise and I'll be your host this evening. Our expert presenters, you can see in the panel, are consultant orthopedic surgeons, Mr. Raman Thacker and Mr. Richard Goddard. Um, and I'll now hand over to Mr. Thacker. Thank you very much. And you'll hear from me again shortly for the questions. Thank you, Louise. Right, uh, Raman Thakur, consultant orthopedic surgeon at Benetton Hospital. Welcome everyone. Just a few words about myself. I trained in orthopedics back uh, home in Hyderabad, India and completed a registrar rotation from Southeast of England. I then further developed my hip and knee uh, reconstruction skills with a fellowship in Lenox Hill and Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, and has been practicing as consultant orthopedic surgeon in East Kent. I've been working at Benenton since 2012. So my remit of talk is on hip arthritis and hip replacement. So let's start with the first obvious questions. I have sort of titled my slides on the most common questions that are asked uh, by patients during the consultation. So I'll try and answer those, um, hopefully. Um, sorry, somebody raised their hand. Is there a problem? Can you hear me? No. Okay. So normally, uh, there are two people who have raised their hands. Is, is there a wonder if there is a problem? You need to unmute yourself. I will advise people via the chat if you carry on. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, also, um, normally, hip is a ball and socket joint, a joint which has smooth uh, cartilage lining the uh, bone ends and has got good, um, uh, that allows good movements uh, on the ball and socket without any uh, problems. But with arthritis, the lining, the cartilage lining of the joint wears away and the underlying bone gets exposed. This leads to the nerves uh, becoming exposed and irritation of the nerves in bone with movement of the hip and inflammation from the wear debris products causing pain and limitation of function. So do I need a hip replacement? The next question. Um, it really depends on the individual uh, patient and the answer really is you will know yourself. And what do we mean by that? Um, so most of the symptoms in hip replacements can be divided into one pain and the pain can be felt in most people in the groin, but also variably in the thigh, down the thigh, in the buttock and over the lateral aspect of the hip. Sometimes the pain can radiate as far down as the knee and very occasionally patients may just present with painful knee and actually have uh, no problems with the knee and severe arthritis in the hip. The stiffness related to the arthritis can manifest itself as inability to do day-to-day uh, -day stuff, bending over, cutting toenails, uh, putting on shoes and socks, and the pain can also manifest itself as instability and giving way from the hip. This combination can then manifest as interference in functions such as walking distances can get reduced. It may affect sleep. It may affect ability to do other stuff, climbing stairs, uh, gardening, uh, getting in and out of car uh, and driving. So in effect, all this pain and limitation of function affects quality of life. And when the quality of life is affected and things cannot be helped with conservative management, such as painkillers um, and uh, uh, physiotherapy, and occasionally a steroid injection in the hip if the arthritis is not too bad, then I think, and if conservative measures have failed, 
then the possibility of looking at a hip replacement. Next question commonly asked is what is a hip replacement made up of? So in a sense, a hip, artificial hip joint has four components. The, the acetabular component, which is a combination of the shell and the liner, and the femoral component, which is a combination of the stem or the pin, which goes into the femur and the bearing, which is the ball. So the liner and the ball make the bearing surfaces and the liner most often is a highly linked cross, a highly cross-linked polyethylene, uh, which is a hard bearing uh, substance along with either a ceramic or a metal ball. Uh, and that moves freely uh, with, and with very low wear uh, allowing long-term lifespan. Whereas with the, um, with the fixation of the prosthesis to the bone depends on the uh, stem and on the uh, shell, which can be either, uh, in this case, they are uncemented and they stick to bone uh, and subsequently bone bonds into them, or sometimes, if the quality of the bone is poor or in uh, uh, certain situations and certain surgeons would like to use a cemented hip replacement where they use bone cement as grout for fixing the prosthesis. Uh, and the idea of doing this sort of uh, procedure uh, and using uh, um, quality materials is to give a modern hip replacement which would hopefully last for decades. How long will I be in hospital and what is the patient journey? So generally, uh, patients come to see us when uh, referred either by the uh, general practitioner or an advanced practitioner because uh, of pain in the hip. Um, sometimes the diagnosis may not be certain. Uh, sometimes the diagnosis has been made. Conservative treatment measures have happened and then a simple investigation such as x-ray or very occasionally an MRI scan may be required to confirm the diagnosis. And once um, the decision is made to proceed with uh, hip replacement surgery, which is made as an informed decision with the patient and carers, then certainly the pathway starts, which involves then coming back and having assessments for pre-assessment uh, with the anesthetist and uh, the team to physiotherapists as well as nurses to ensure um, that uh, it is safe for us to proceed with your operation at Benenden and give you more information on the pathway. Patients are admitted to the hospital on the day of the surgery and come down to theater to have their operation. Most patients are up and about on the day of surgery, uh, particularly if it is done in the morning and they're recovered from the anesthetic. Sometimes if it is late in the afternoon, it may be the day following surgery. Then they progress on with physiotherapy, having uh, blood tests and x-rays, and if everything is looking fine, they are discharged when they are safe. Uh, uh, typically within two to three days. The criteria usually is that you are safe on your feet and independently mobile. Uh, most patients have done stairs and uh, the wound is healing satisfactorily and the dressings are dry. There are hip precautions which uh, will be explained to the patients and usually in place for about six weeks after surgery. Post-operatively, patients ask various activities and when they can start and safe walking, as we said, on the day of surgery, driving, riding a bike uh, and uh, travel. Probably a uh, travel will be, uh, just talk about driving and riding a bike, usually at six weeks post-surgery. Travel here is in the context of air travel and again, uh, if it is a long haul flight, certainly no, not before six weeks. The concern is uh, problems with blood clots uh, post-surgery, and obviously the air travel increases the risk of blood clots, so hence the delay uh, for travel. 
uh, other questions, having sex, getting back to work again. Uh, it, that may be anywhere between four to six weeks. Again, it has to be gentle. Certain positions should be avoided with sex and getting back to work. Uh, most people depends on the type of work. If it is light work, desk-based job, after four to six weeks, uh, once you start driving, if you need to get to work, six weeks. Uh, however, if it is heavy duty and uh, um, intensive, then there may be a phase return to work, usually two to three months down the line. Playing golf and tennis, again, three to, uh, you can start sort of uh, driving and putting uh, anywhere between four to six weeks, but uh, further uh, um, swinging and uh, playing of golf on the co on the course uh, and swinging uh, would be certainly uh, anywhere up to three months. Uh, skiing usually advise to skip this skiing uh, the year of uh, hip replacement and follow it the following year. What things could go wrong? Obviously, hip replacements are a very successful operation. Over 100,000 hip replacements are done uh, per year in England alone. And uh, over 90% of people are pleased and happy with the outcome of surgery. But there are some risks, and these are real. They are rare, and the most common is probably blood clots. Um, uh, blood loss we are concerned of, and if it is uh, particularly patients are on blood thinners, and if any person uh, is lose a significant amount of blood, they may need a blood transfusion uh, to restore their hemoglobin levels. Infection is uh, extremely uncommon at Benenden, less than one percent. However, infection is one of the most serious complications that can happen and the concern if the pro infection goes to the prosthesis, uh, it may mean that the prosthesis may have to come out to clear the infection uh, and uh, um, if it is not cleared by antibiotics. Dislocation and leg length discrepancy, that's what we meant about uh, taking precautions in that first six weeks because the hip replacement is held in by sutures alone and having uh, putting a hip into a position where the sutures are tested then can cause the ball to pop out of the socket. Uh, very rarely damage of tissue surrounding, uh, all the clockwork is very close by. Uh, to our operation and uh, there is risk of damage to tissues. In the longer term, hip replacements can come loose or the, the components can wear and they might require revision surgery. Sorry, apologize for showing these pictures of uh, uh, um, scars, uh, just uh, to give a little brief on how hip replacement scars, these are none of my patients, but just a collection uh, showing early, uh, from counterclockwise from the bottom right, uh, early uh, within one week of surgery, uh, three to four weeks, uh, and then uh, a bit more mature scar three, to month, uh, three months down the line. Bruising is something and swelling, that can be quite uh, common. Uh, usually it is not as marked as uh, and uh, alarming as in this patient, but the important thing to remember is for reducing the blood clots, we pay, put patients on blood thinners and therefore any bleeding can actually accentuate. And where, if somebody is sitting for a longer time after the hip replacement, which uh, happens, in most patients, then that bruising can track down with gravity to the knee and sometimes down to the ankle. Uh, and sometimes may be associated with swelling and muscle cramps in the, in the lower limb. There are various uh, support tools to enable patients to make a decision. And one of the support, such support tool is on the National Joint Register patient page. And if you go uh, and click on the patient decision support tool, it will open up the thing and give you um, uh, a page where you can put in uh, functional 
uh, answer some questions which include the demographics and the functional limitations uh, of uh, yourself and then it produces personalized chart showing the benefits and the revision rates and risks uh, more accurate to the individual um, uh, and help guide decision making for surgery thank you Thank you, Raman, for your talk. It was uh, yeah, most enjoyable. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Richard Goddard. I'm one of the orthopedic consultants here at Benenden, um, specializing in knee surgery. So I'm going to talk uh, about knee replacements and do a whistle-stop tour about the various types of knee replacements and why uh, you should have one or consider one. So knee replacement is a common operation, mainly for wear and tear osteoarthritis, that uh, patients with inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid or damage due to gout, also may need a knee replacement. And patients who've had previous injuries, perhaps sporting injuries, damaging the ligaments and cartilage, this also leads to secondary um, arthritic tech changes. And people who've had accidents, trauma, fractures, also may need a knee replacement in the future. Um, the aim of a knee replacement is similar to hip replacement, really. It's aimed to restore function, help someone's pain, uh, realign the uh, deformity of the leg and increase patient's mobility and improve their quality of life. Uh, I'm seeing time and time again patients becoming uh, younger for knee replacements and have greater expectations. So it's important to know what you want out of a knee replacement and discuss that with the surgeon. So knee replacement, similar to hip replacement, is a very common operation, approximately 100,000 performed in the UK every year. The average age is 65 to 68, but this is an average and people clearly to make the average a lot are older and many patients now are younger. Slightly more females than males having knee replacements and approximately 94 to 95% of patients uh, report a good health improvement following a knee replacement. And similar to hips, they're lasting many, many years and approximately 80% of knee replacements can last around 20 and even 25 years. The knee replacement um, everyone, uh, every surgeon uses at uh, Benenden is the Vanguard knee replacement made by Zimmer Biomet. This has had the highest um, rating of the um, knee replacement can have. It has a very good 10 year survivorship more than 96% uh, are lasting 10 years. And it has a long heritage of a predecessor knee replacement, the AGC, um, which um, approximately 70% were lasting 30 years. Um, the ones used at uh, Benenden are cemented to the bone and you can do the knee replacement with or without replacing the kneecap, the patella. And there's a progression of knee replacements which can be more stabilized to deal with severe deformities. So what are the symptoms of osteoarthritis of the knee? Um, early, you may just get pain on demanding activities, long walks, sporting activities, running, walking around the golf course, playing tennis. Some patients have stiffness and swelling in the morning and a sensation of the knee clicking, crunching, grinding. Symptoms later on are very similar to what we've heard with the hip. Patients have more severe pain, limiting their mobility, limiting their walking distance. Um, pain at rest, just sitting in a chair is very common and patients as well describe pain at night. They may wake during the night and find it difficult to get back to sleep. And also with the knee, it commonly wears out on one side or the other and patients then get a deformity, which can either make the knee go a, as a bow-legged deformity or knock kneed. And the x-ray just there on the page shows that the, the patient is going knock kneed compared to the normal x-ray. So arthritis goes through a number of stages and it's really damage to the cartilage inside the knee joint. So the normal cartilage is lovely and smooth and looks similar to a piece of china or a billiard ball. Um, early arthritis, the cartilage is slightly soft and becomes damaged. And in stage two arthritis, you see the cartilage becoming fibrillated, meaning it looks like blades of grass or seaweed underwater. This then progresses, the cartilage becomes very uh, thin and starts crumbling away 
And a good analogy is to think of the surface of a road and a surface of a dirt track. It looks more like a dirt track or the surface of the moon. And then as the arthritis becomes very severe with grade four, you get full thickness cartilage loss, the bones are exposed. And on weight bearing, you may get bone on bone, which is evident on x-rays that uh, will be taken. So the treatment of arthritis of the knee isn't, to, isn't always surgical. There's non-surgical treatments which must be tried first. Uh, weight loss is always a good starting point if one considers themselves overweight. Exercise and physiotherapy. Modify activities and have expectations of what your activity level should be. Um, simple analgesia, over-the-counter medication, paracetamol, anti-inflammatories if tolerated and then visit your GP to be prescribed more, um, more stronger painkilling tablets. Some patients have good uh, benefits from various knee straps and supports, which can help with walking and playing sports. And there are various injections that you can try, such as steroid injections and lubricating um, injections. The one shown in the picture is Duralane, which we commonly use at Benenden. There are a number of surgical treatments. If you catch the arthritis early, sometimes keyhole surgery can be helpful. Uh, in some instances, especially younger patients, you may try and correct the alignment of the limb, but commonly um, end-stage arthritis would need a knee replacement. So prior to surgery, it's important to optimize one's health, weight loss, um, pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, that type of thing should be well controlled to make the anesthetic surgery and subsequent recovery quicker. Uh, Prehabilitation is saying where possible, try and strengthen the muscles around the knee to improve muscle memory and muscle strength. This not only helps recovery, uh, but also in some patients can Im improve um, their sort of length of stay in hospital and, and that type of thing. Prior to knee replacements, you'll have pre-assessment uh, by the nurse and see the anaesthetist who will discuss the suitability of an anaesthetic with the individual patient and the various options uh, for anaesthetic, but commonly um, a spinal anaesthetic is, um, is used for knee replacements. So after a knee replacement, uh, there's close monitoring on the ward, pain management, sickness control from the anesthetic drugs, early mobilization. So similar to a hip replacement, we try and get you out of bed, walking around the same day, sat in a chair, doing your exercises, improving the range of movement. You'll have routine blood tests and x-rays to check the operations all gone well. And most people would stay in hospital for two nights. Next slide, please. So similar to hip replacements, knee replacement is a big operation and there are a number of uh, risks uh, during the surgery. Uh, there's a risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, one could need a blood transfusion. A lot of knee replacements are done under a tourniquet to stop blood going to the knee. And this often limits the need for blood transfusion. Uh, damage to the bone uh, with the fracture and perforation of the bone is fortunately very rare. Injury to the arteries and nerves again is fortunately very rare approximately one in 10,000. Uh, during recovery, there could be wound problems, wound leaks, wound infection, requiring antibiotics. Again, blood clots uh, in the leg, deep venous thrombosis, and these can travel to the lungs as an embolus. And we prescribe blood thinning medication uh, for two weeks to try and help prevent this. Obviously, the knee is painful, stiff and sore, and patients walk with crutches or a frame and there'll be an obvious limp for the first few weeks. Later on, knee replacements uh, are similar to hips. They can, they're made of artificial material, metal and plastic, and this can wear, subsequently loosen and fail and need for revision surgery. And with a knee replacement, if one is to have an accident, fall from a ladder, et cetera, it's theoretically possible to fracture the bone around the knee replacement. Uh, next slide. So knee replacements, there's a number of options. You can have a total knee replacement, replacing uh, the end of the thigh bone and the end of the shin bone, and uh, sometimes the kneecap. This is the most common type of knee replacement. In specific situations, you can replace just part of the knee, replace the inside, uh, the so-called Oxford or medial compartment knee replacement, and you can replace isolated uh, kneecap joints, although these uh, operations are quite uh, uncommon 
because that pattern of arthritis is relatively rare. As one progresses through knee replacements, you can then need more constraint to more uh, larger knee replacement surgery to cope with various deformities and, and loss of ligaments. So here we see a common uh, deformity. This patient has bilateral arthritis of both knees and he's got the bow leg deformity. And we can see the x-ray after the operation shows that the um, deformity is nicely corrected and the picture in the middle shows the knee is nice and straight. And this is a common pattern of arthritis that we all see. Um, some patients unfortunately leave their knee to go into severe arthritis and this, this poor patient had a uh, very subluxed uh, knee, severe deformity requiring as we see on the x-ray on the right a more constrained type of knee replacement and we'd urge patients to have their knee checked out before it gets so bad. Um, all is not lost, there are even more complicated knee replacements where the top part and the bottom part are physically linked together with a hinge. And this is a, a, an unusual operation, but commonly for severe bone loss, severe deformity, and patients having revision surgery. So what are the requirements of a knee replacement? Um, we need uh, a knee replacement to restore the mechanical access of the patient. Um, it's known that if the knee replacement is put a few degrees out of alignment, um, then uh, the, the forces going through the knee replacement are altered and it makes the knee replacement more prone to failure. So each surgeon will use various techniques to, techniques to restore each individual's patient's mechanical access. And we need the implants to have a good uh, longevity and uh, improperative flexibility so the surgeon can decide what the best knee replacement is as the operations progressing. Uh, patients are becoming younger and all patients demands are getting more and more with respect to work, sports, hobbies, patients wanting to ski, do long walks, climb mountains, etc. And so patients expectations are changing. And there's a number of advances in knee replacements and at Benenden we use uh, in special circumstances a signature knee replacement this is not better than the standard knee replacement, but it has a number of indications. Commonly patients who've got abnormal anatomy, uh, either due to uh, how their bones have been uh, formed at birth or following uh, various fractures, um, which makes standard instrumentation during the knee replacement more difficult. And in very young patients, those in their 40s and 50s, you may want to use signature to try and get the um, alignment as accurate as possible. Uh, so with a standard knee replacement, commonly we take our measurements from uh, weight bearing x-rays. With signature knee replacements, we take MRI scans or CT scans of the hip, the knee and the ankle. And then a special computer program works out with the surgeon uh, that patient's uh, mechanical alignment and then a plan is formed, which the surgeon has to agree or disagree with. And once it's approved, then the final plan is put into place. So special guides are made. These are actually dispose disposable, but instead of using normal standard instruments, these guides uh, fit the individual patient. And they're so specific that if you leave them made for three months, nine months, the knee joint may have changed subtly so they don't fit as accurate as they should. So the end outcome is exactly the same as a standard knee replacement. You still end up with the same Vanguard replacement, but you're using the signature to try and get the components as seated as accurately as possible and in the best alignment as possible, which theoretically can improve recovery and range of movement. But it's worth stressing that not everyone is suitable for a signature knee replacement. It's down to the individual surgeon to discuss that with you. So that's my whistle stop tour of uh, knee replacements and we're both happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you both, that was very interesting. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, the last, and the first is um, a little long, so I'll, I'll say it slowly. Um, 
this person has had osteoarthritis in their knee for a number of years and it's become very painful recently. They manage this with the use of pain relief medication, adjusting the dosage as and when necessary. They keep mobile as possible and do physio ex physiotherapy exercises, although not as frequently as maybe they should. They would like to know if they can continue to be managed long term or possibly improved with exercise, or is it inevitable that they will indefinitely indefinitely need um, some surgery at some point? Um, I would probably say it's not it's not set in stone that you'll need a knee replacement, but I'd probably urge you to have a consultation, have x-rays, then the surgeon can see the severity of the arthritis. If it's a pattern of arthritis that's not too severe and the surgeon's happy there's no bone loss and no severe deformity and the ligaments are stable, then you can carry on with gentle exercise, physiotherapy, strengthening the muscles and painkillers as long as that's um, working for you. If you remember one of my slides, it showed a patient with a very severe deformity. They'd ignored their symptoms. And so I'd, I'd urge you to at least uh, have a consultation, get an x-ray and take advice. But by having a consultation doesn't necessarily mean you will definitely need a knee replacement. Yeah, true. Thank you. OK, um, this person is thinking of having steroid injections into the hip before resorting to surgery. What would this involve? And is it something that we recommend trying before surgery at Bennington? You're muted, Mr. Pecker, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Um, so the it is a escalation of treatment pathway. And if people are finding that the pain is not controlled by simple analgesics and uh, physiotherapy, and more often than not, uh, if there is a need for a short term improvement in symptoms. So if there's an occasion coming up, say attending a wedding, or a uh, holiday and you want to have a few weeks of uh, good control of pain, then certainly having a steroid injection can allow you to have that temporary uh, benefit in terms of relief of pain and possibly improvement of function. Now, there are if it is early arthritis where patients sometimes you do get patients who have had not a lot of change on x-ray, but their level of symptoms are much, much uh, significant, then in that patient scenario, certainly the steroid injection uh, relief can last several months and could possibly be repeated uh, to allow them to continue to function. So I think, as uh, Richard has said earlier, I think the first and foremost thing is a consultation to see if that is the right thing to do. And secondly, to understand how further down the line in arthritis uh, the hip has gone and how long the benefit of having a steroid injection uh, will be for uh, in your particular case. And to also understand that steroid injections are not a course. It is not something that we will recommend having multiple injections because it doesn't actually cure the problem. It is still a, a injection to help with relief of pain and reducing inflammation in the joint. So the underlying process will still continue. So if people are taking steroid injections and carrying on, the likelihood is that they are going to wear out their joint more and more. So it is, it is I think, in an individualized situation, certainly worth review by a specialist and having that discussion uh, as whether appropriate in your case or not. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for you, Mr. Goddard. Um, does needing a knee replacement on the same leg affect recovery from a hip operation? 
Um, I assume it's the if, same leg as the hip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you've already had a hip replacement many years ago, then it's usually safe to have a knee replacement. If you've had a recent hip replacement, then I'd probably wait for the hip replacement to fully settle down before you need a knee replacement in most circumstances. So if you can still mobilize, it's probably worth leaving the hip replacement six months a year to sort of settle down because during a knee replacement under the anesthetic, you are moving the leg around and we don't want to sort of disrupt the healing of the hip or cause a dislocation or anything like that. Um, if, if, if a patient is very severely affected with hip and knee arthritis and they're essentially wheelchair bound and unable to mobilize due to both joints, then in those extreme situations, uh, you may do a hip replacement first and then two or three months later, uh, then do a, a knee replacement so they can gain mobility. But generally speaking, it's quite common for patients to have a successful hip replacement then a number of years later have a knee replacement and vice versa. Uh, patients who've had a successful knee replacement can have a successful hip replacement. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Thacker, could you advise on the criteria for them to have a hip replacement if you're a very large person? So BMI is the uh, word used uh, to quantify uh, the cutoff for surgery at Bennington. And what it means is the relationship of height and weight of the individual. And at the moment, the cutoff at Benenden is 40. So if you are over 40, then certainly um, having measures to help reduce the weight uh, uh, will certainly be important uh, for us to make the operation safe. Um, and there are uh, certainly advice from your doctor and there are also some weight uh, uh, management specialists at Benenden who can advise mm. on that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, this person is a 68 year old. They walk long list distances most days. However, they've recently developed inside right knee pain, which is a sharp shooting pain. They also experience pain just above the right buttock. The right knee is swollen and has some sort of fluid on the outside. What would you recommend they do? I mean, so, certainly this patient needs further investigation. So um, attending, uh, I mean, you can pop to your GP and discuss that with, with them. Or if you want an answer quicker, then you can uh, have a consultation, see one of us. And with those symptoms, I'd be the most common place to have early arthritis in the knee is on the inside so-called medial compartment arthritis. So at your initial assessment, we'd get some weight bearing x-rays of the knee. And from those x-rays, we'd be able to tell if there's any significant arthritis or not. If there is significant arthritis, then that's the diagnosis made at 68. If the knee joint looks perfect, then we'd probably do an MRI scan to see if there's any cartilage damage, which uh, can occur at any age but commonly we'd be operating on cartilage damage in, in younger people. If someone complained of buttock pain at the consultation, we'd want to assess the movement of the hip joint. And if we were worried that they could have arthritis of the hip and this as well, if there's stiffness, reduce movement of the hip, this could be contributing to the knee pain. So we'd get um, x-rays of the hip and the pelvis. And also we'd ask questions to see if any of the pain could be radiating from the lower back, which is also common. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another knee question. My right knee will occasionally lock when I've been sitting and it is painful. Is there something wrong within my knee joint? Um, So-called mechanical symptoms, locking and giving way are, are common and often but not always mean there is uh, a potential problem. Um, so common causes of locking would be osteoarthritis, um, could be loose bodies, uh, like little uh, bits of uh, like pea-sized bits of bone and cartilage, which can form um, like kidney stones, you could say, and they can occur in the knee and cause locking. And also uh, 
cartilage problems such as meniscal cartilage tears and loose and torn cartilage could cause the knee to lock. So if you have locking of the knee and it's uh, painful, then I'd certainly say it's uh, abnormal. And then you ought to seek advice where we can get x-rays and possibly an MRI scan to look into it further. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Thacker, this person used to be a keen runner and would train for long distances. They were able to do heart would they be able to do half marathons again after having hip replacement surgery? So generally, uh, the advice is to avoid impact activities uh, following any joint replacement, whether it's a hip or a knee, uh, and marathon or long distance running would certainly fall into that category. However, and therefore it is something that one would generally advise against. Um, however, I have known people who have done it and who have been successful at it in terms of completing it. But it is not something that one would officially condone and say, yes, everybody can do it. The bearings that were developed to allow people to be able to do a lot more impact stuff was uh, like the metal on metal hip replacements. But uh, um, obviously there's been a lot of press and awareness that such bearings have caused people more problems and they have uh, uh, caused uh, early revision in a lot more number of patients than was expected. So um, we are still I think the, the bearing combinations which we have with the ceramic and the plastic are very good and with normal usage have decades uh, of service. If somebody does a lot of impact activity, then the failure and the wear of the plastic and uh, the joint uh, longevity will be uh, significantly reduced. So it may not cause problems in the short term, but in the long term, is going to cause problems. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Goddard, um, this lady is considering um, bariatric surgery. How long after this surgery is, is it considered the right amount of time to get to knee replacement surgery? Thank you. I mean, it's very difficult to answer accurately, but I would probably say have the bariatric surgery and then obviously you'll be monitoring the, the weight loss. I've had patients before I've referred for bariatric surgery and a number of those have come back after losing significant weight saying their knee arthritic pain is a lot better and they've delayed their knee replacement for a number of years. Um, as Mr. Thacker was saying, it's really what your BMI is. So if you're even after bariatric surgery, ideally we'd like your BMI to be below 40 and that then makes the operation um, a lot safer. So it's, there's no definite uh, target for how much you must weigh. It's really whether, when your BMI is in the safe range and um, if after losing the weight, your symptoms are still severe. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thacker, would you do a hip replacement on an eight-year-old? I think age is certainly not a criteria to deny anybody a joint replacement. I think more importantly is the fitness and the medical condition of the individual. Mm. And uh, we, I have certainly operated on people in their 90s and uh, given them hip replacement surgery. And sometimes if people have gone to the age of 90, 80, they have actually proved that they are physically uh, much, much, uh, and physiologically much better than somebody in their 70s with other medical uh, conditions. So I think what is most important is the level of symptoms, the uh, physical fitness of the individual and their medical uh, conditions. So if uh, those criteria are met and certainly uh, the hip needs uh, operating, then I would certainly offer one. Thank you. Um, how long after a knee replacement can you fly or drive? A very common question. So 
in a nutshell, I'd probably say a knee replacement is a, a very painful operation. It's more painful than a hip replacement. Um, so usually for the first six weeks, it's really getting the knee moving, gently pottering around at home, taking analgesia. It's really critical get that you get a good range of movement of the knee early. Most patients, we wouldn't recommend driving until six weeks um, after the uh, knee replacement. If, ever, if, however, you're a little bit slower to get going, still on crutches or sticks, then it may be eight weeks or slightly longer. Occasionally, people with automatic cars having their left knee replaced, they're off their sticks by four or five weeks, then it may be safe at that stage to drive short distances. But generally speaking, driving is six weeks. Um, flying, I usually say to people, most people wouldn't think about or enjoy going on a holiday for probably three months. So I'd certainly give it a good three months before flying. Physically, you could probably fly at six to eight weeks, but with a knee replacement, you certainly wouldn't enjoy a holiday, uh, most people for about three months afterwards. Okay, thank you. Right, um, we do have quite a lot more questions, but I think we'll um, pause them for now and we'll answer them after the event. If you, you two are okay with that, we'll just um, we'll email you all with the, with the answers. I hope that's okay. Um, so if you would like to book a consultation, please do contact the 